this room is completely quiet and I am home alone. Hi, welcome. Welcome back if you've been here before. I'm Little Beauty and Hitcher. Back for another hot video. All right, so this video is going to become a little bread tubey. Uh, I actually wrote this video in the summer of 2020 when COVID was nothing more than a twinkle in the eye of Fauci? No, that's not right. <laughs> COVID wasn't really a widespread thing at that point, so I was still very normal. Are you sure about that? Reading through this research that I put together, I am amazed by the brain power I had before three or so years of lockdown rotted pretty much everything in here. I made it just in time to miss Pride Month. That's just the kind of person I am. But you know what? I'm queer every day for all of my life, so whatever. I feel like the amount of research <laughs> that is in this script needs to be respected. We're serious here. Preamble. Have you ever had a conversation with a straight person or a cishet person recently? And the the rhetoric is, well, the rhetoric has been, and this, this rhetoric appears every few years, but it is the theory that being queer is a new thing, being trans is a new thing, being bisexual is a new thing, being non-binary is a new thing. Anything under the queer umbrella is a new thing. This rhetoric gets uh, lifted out of its cradle and revived like a vampire. Revived like the vampire from the movie Underworld every few years to, you know, hinder progress. <laughs> we love that. I'm here to tell you that that's straight up just ahistorical to say that any of these LGBTIQ plus identities are new. Without further ado, let's talk about the history and the mythology of ancient societies and queer interpretation of myth. The whole thesis of this research was to say being queer, being trans, being non-binary, being bisexual, etc, etc, etc. Not new things, old as f things actually. Yeah, mythology has shaped the way we perceive human history. It's as useful to look back on as like cave paintings or scrolls of the Dead Sea ancient historical texts or like tombs or you know mythology gives us the same kind of insight as physical historical evidence does we learn a lot about humans at that point in time how their society functioned through the eyes of mythology mythology often played in part with like giving innovation so a good example of mythology and innovation colliding is calendars uh we still use calendars every day calendars are actually old as f and have kind of an interesting history but this is not a video about calendars so when you think of like sexuality and gender and the theory of those two things when do you think they became a part of the, the, you know, when do you think they became part of the fabric of society? Well, pretty much back when civilization started, essentially. Huge reveal. Vine, boom sound. If you've looked back at older videos of mine, you know, mythologies is one of those things that I've always been obsessed with since like a kid. So yeah, I've made videos in the past about just myth and talking about the myth and interpreting it into a modern uh, understanding. And I'm gonna do that again right now in this video. Lots of things that are like in current society now that people consider fads are as much as a fad as uh, modern indoor plumbing. Everyone thought that would just go out of fashion eventually and every day I use a toilet still. So boy howdy, I love my toilet. I mean, I couldn't live without it, I guess. When we discuss mythology, obviously from a academic perspective, as much as I hate to say that, we have to interpret it given it stood in place of like moral code and like I said, religion and philosophy intersecting. That represents what the moral code of that society was at that given time. And if you ignore mythology when looking at history, you ignore like a huge part of the picture. Mythology covers 
six thematic roles and as far as like its function the first is obviously creation you know there's creation myths in like every major religion and mythology and law how humans were made why we're here the second is justification and validation this is as far as defining customs bridging the gap between like the primitive man from creation and the civilized man that exists in that time explaining the reason behind cultural practices so it justifies like ritual sacrifice or why babies get thrown in off of a cliff you know you wouldn't do that unless it was justified and you felt it was morally right three is guidance so stories of just how to be i'll touch on guidance a bit more um, because that's where the moral stuff comes in quite a lot fourth is worship and gratitude obviously this ties in with guidance and setting a moral compass it reminds us that there is something bigger than us something that created us that went out of its way to make us so we must be humble and show respect fifth is fear and repentance Obviously, that's pretty straightforward. If you do bad things against our moral code, you go to a bad place. You can pray and ask for forgiveness. And you show repentance, etc. And the sixth is more of a miscellaneous category. Health, inspiration, psychology and science. Teaching of ways we could improve life, whether that be like I said with calendars so we can track the moon cycles and essentially amongst in between and around all of that is backstory and lore and like personifying the gods so we like connect with them in a way where we relate to them but also respect them and you know behave as as the gods do unless it's like Zeus who's doing all kinds of naughty things all over the place. So a good example of this is uh, Aesop's Fables. I'm sure you've heard of Aesop's Fables. Um, the rabbit and the... nope. The uh, tortoise and the hare is an Aesop fable. Those who take their time and um, do things carefully win the race. I think that was what the lesson was. I have a collection of Aesop... I have a collection of Aesop fables here, so let's let's like derive a moral thing. Let's derive morality from this baby. All right, here's one. Mercury and the Tradesman. When Jupiter was creating man, he told Mercury to make an infusion of lies and to add it to a little of the other ingredients which went into making the Tradesman. Mercury did so and introduced an equal amount into each turn. The tallow chandler, the green grocer, the haberdasher, and all till he came to the horse dealer who was the last on the list, and when finding that he had a quantity of the infusion still left, he put it all into him. And that is why tradesmen lie. But none of them lie as much as the horse dealer. So I think what we're meant to gauge from that morally is capitalism is bad, but the baddest capitalist is the horse dealer. I'm so glad I can go through my life with that in mind now. And, uh, you know, as much as I have just gone on and talked about how important mythology was, I can acknowledge that some of it is just frankly a bit silly. And like we have science now, so it can explain a lot of things. Like for example, in Norse mythology, clouds were created when um, a giant named Ema um, just like smashed his head open and his brains kind of like went everywhere and his brain matter is the clouds. I don't think that is fact, but no hate if that's what you believe. I guess the point I'm trying to make here is that mythology gives us like this unique perspective. Anyways, I couldn't think of a good segue to move on. So anyways, let's talk about sexuality and gender in mythology. So I have to add a disclaimer here. So let me just read off my disclaimer that I've written. <laughs> a lot of mythology with the exclusion of classical myth is not well preserved or readily available outside the cultures they're significant to. Along with this, we must take in a grain of salt and recognize that myth was interpreted and adapted for the most part by white Christian Western men, either with colonial settler motivations or through the means directed by the church and or Western education systems 
that too were heavily confined within a specific set of ideals. As myth was spread and shared primarily through the means of cultural transmission, it is important that we question such rigid barriers. Now, cultural transmission, I think I need to explain a bit here. Cultural transmission is a sociological term that means uh, basically that stories and social traits are shared through communication and I pick up certain traits because my parents did it and their parents did it before them etc etc so myth works on the same kind of thing where you know it's an oral uh, tradition so it's shared through word of mouth much of the perception of these interpretations imprint the importance of marriage monogamy gender binarism intercourse for reproduction not recreation and denial of certain aspects of human nature we are told to repress as the result of the spread of Western Christian ideals. I don't discount the fact that many societies did in fact function under patriarchal standards, but I also stress that it is important to be incredulous of classical interpretations as an absolute truth or the whole picture. For all we know, aspects of certain myth could have potentially been mistranslated or purposely misinterpreted to fit a specific agenda of the domineering societal ideals of that current time. While I wish to be as historically correct or true to the versions of the myths I have found, I want to exercise a sense of reclamation and also some scrutiny about the themes and constraints of these myths in which they fit within. So I'm going to issue a trigger warning now. There was really no way around using certain terms when explaining the context of myths. R word, misogyny, trans misogyny and transphobia, the discussion of medicalization of intersex people, homophobia, and just potentially sterile or problematic language used in the context of myth. Primarily that is uh, when we get into the gender section and I'll explain that a bit more when we reach that section. That would not be in this video, it'll be in the video coming after this. So like I said, with you know the mythologies across all cultures, classical myth was the one that kind of was the most prominent, was the most uh, well-preserved, people could read about it. So classical myth generally covers Greek mythology, Roman mythology, and also Egypt. Egyptian mythology. Everyone knows at least a little bit of Greek mythology. Uh, they've seen the movie Hercules or whatever. So yes, as I said, this will be in two videos. So this first video, I will be just covering sexuality. And then in the next video, we will talk more about gender. Although there is a bit of gender in the sexuality section just because of certain myths. So obviously, as I said, Greek mythology is basically the most common as well as Roman, but Roman literally just copied Greek mythology. They literally just took Greek mythology and changed the names. <laughs> That's it. Bisexuality was a big thing in Greece. You know, the big fella himself, Zeus, was a raging bisexual. He had sexual relationships with both men and women. He wasn't a nice person and he often didn't have sex out of love. Granted, uh, some of the sex in specifically Greek myth is more of an expression of power and domination rather than an act of love. I do have a story that is just about bros loving bros and that is the myth of Poseidon and Nerides or Nerides, Nerides. We all know who Poseidon was. He was like the big, big god of the sea. Poseidon was a, a an Olympian god, which was kind of like the big famous like celebrity gods. He was Zeus's brother. He was also a big old bisexual. A funny thing when I was reading of Nerides, Nerides, if he was a minor sea god, um, son of Nereus, normal Greek mythology name, and Doris normal Greek mythology name. I just think it's funny when Greek mythology has like Heracles, Perseus, Ares, all these like powerful sounding names, Athena, Aphrodite, you know, and then Doris. Doris was there in the ocean. So Doris had 50 daughty, daughties. <laughs> Doris had 50 daughters, which is just honestly a bit much. Uh, they were called the Nereids, and she had those 50 daughters, and then she had her first son, Nerides. That's a lot of sisters, bro. They would have been like braiding his hair and shit. What you need to know is that Poseidon was cruising the seas one day and saw Nerides and was like, He thought Nerides was just like hot as shit. They bonded over Nerides being like a real good chariot driver, charioteer. It's kind of like Fast and the Furious, like when Paul Walker and Vin Diesel fell in love. But you know, they 
fall in love and they go on chariot rides together and that's like the thing that they do and like dolphins dive up and swim around them and it's very beautiful and nice and then comes the day where they decide to go consummate their love and they're gonna go to bone town on each other and when they do this they end up materializing a new god just out of thin air from this cloud of smoke pops out Anteros who became the god of mutual and reciprocated love that's so wholesome <laughs> you think of like the bible with like Gautam and Samora I just said Gautam and Samora with Sodom and Gomorrah and like bum sex is bad and men having male male sex is so bad it's like the worst and then in greek mythology they're like yeah you had a baby basically who's also like not legally your baby he's his own man you know these two guys just had a passionate love making sesh and uh created just a new god and it's like a good one you know because it is greek mythology it does have to end in tragedy there are two different interpretations of what happened next uh either aphrodite also kind of had a thing for nerides and was pissed that he ended up going off with poseidon and poseidon was aphrodite's uncle i think you know like imagine you think a guy is hot and then he goes and your uncle i guess that pissed her off so she transformed him into a seashell uh the alternative version is how i mentioned that nerides uh loved to ride chariots well he claimed he was better than the best chariot guy ever who was helios who chariots the sun across the sky so like helios was pissed and transformed him into a seashell so i guess the moral we take away there is don't have sex with Aphrodite's uncle or something if you're hot only. As I said earlier, I was very into Aztec mythology as a child. My favorite god I wrote an assignment about was Huitzilopochtli, who was the god of ritual sacrifice. I was 11. I was weird. So in Mesoamerica, which is like basically all of South America, um, there was different societies. So we're talking about Aztec here. So we have the Aztec god Xocopilli and Xococetzal. So Xocopilli was the god of flowers. Uh, his twin sister Xococetzal was the patron of arts, music and dance. And they both presided over flowers, passion and non-procreative sex. They had a guy for that. They had two guys for that, actually. So Shokopili and Shokoketzal uh, lived in the divine paradise known as Tamanchan. I'm sorry if that's not pronounced properly. It wasn't exactly heaven, but it was like a paradise. It was a safe space for women <laughs> and Shokopili was allowed there because of his effeminate nature. So I did have a note in here that could be viewed as problematic. You know, the whole concept of the flamboyant Twinkie uh, gay man. But we have to remember here that Aztec culture and Aztec land was colonized by the Spanish, by a guy whose conquest, he said the purpose was spiritual, which really meant that he wanted to go over there and convert all the indigenous people to Christianity. So with that understanding, I think it's important to just keep it in mind when we talk about Shokopili. So yes, uh, Shokopili was described as being a very feminine man. Do you fucking mind? What we understand of Aztec culture, and again, I don't know if we view it this way because of Spanish colonization uh, warping the image or if this was true to the time, but Aztec culture was considered to be very like aggressive and masculine. <laughs> I don't really think it was necessarily after reading some of these myths, but you know, there was a whole thing of male honor. So that would be either you go to war or you are a defender or you're just really strong and you can show off your physical feats. You know, there's that like sport that they played. I'm pretty sure it was Mayan culture that did it, but they had violent sports where like the prize was sacrificed because that was like the highest honor. Anyways, 
Aside from that, Shakopili was known to have rejected the concept of masculinity, meaning violent and strong, and decided to give up the concept of masculinity for an easy and soft life of sodomy. Not my words, this is strictly right from the interpretation. He also felt he could reclaim the sense of physical strength to not be about just being violent in general, but he he danced, he liked to dance, and that was how he expressed his physical strength. Aside from these guys, like Shokapili and Shokaketsal um, being the gods that were prayed to for like recreational sex and stuff. They were also worshipped as deities by sex workers. Uh, sex workers prayed to Shokaketsal or Shokapili. Sex work is obviously the oldest profession in the world and you have to have gods for it. We support sex work in this house. So Shokapili was considered to be like a merciful god. The only time he was known to give harsh punishments was in the event of a thing known as the Dance of Flowers. It heavily influenced what modern day Mardi Gras is. It was like a big uh, festival for love, sex, flamboyancy, uh, dance, passion, etc. The only time Shakopili would be a bit harsher of his worshippers is if they did not remain abstinent four days prior to the Dance of Flowers. Uh, he would curse them with the venereal disease. But the good thing is that once the Dance of Flowers began, you could just go pray to him to make your VD go away. And he usually would, you know, just no more itchy junk. We move on to Egypt. Uh, this myth, I have added a bit of a disclaimer for myself. This is a very um, speculative myth. This has never been really like concretely written anywhere. But like I said, if white Christian men can go into regions and choose to interpret myth to suit their ideals, then why can't I? So let's talk about Isis and Nephthys, who were Egyptian goddesses. Now, a little preamble here, just myths between lesbians in general just are really, really, really difficult to find. Like even when you look at the Bible, for example, like I've mentioned previously, Sodom and Gomorrah, men having sex with each other was a, a sin and a bad thing, but lesbian sex was not acknowledged at all. Lesbians weren't really a hot topic, I guess. But um, a really good video to watch if you want more information around Christianity and lesbianism. Um, Strange Eons made a really good video on uh, lesbian nuns where she kind of addresses lesbianism not really being referenced in religion. Um, so I will link that down below and I highly recommend you watch it. So yeah, Isis and Nephthys were two goddesses of ancient Egypt. Technically, they were sisters. I'm not saying it's a good thing, but like, here's the deal with mythology. They didn't have a uh, genetic science or an understanding of genetics or heritable traits or mutations and birth defects. They didn't have that. So like having sex with your family members was kind of normal. I don't support <laughs> incest. That's my stance, but in this instance, we have to just kind of uh, put a wall up and ignore that um, they were sisters. Hey, they can't actually reproduce with one another. Actually, no, because technically Poseidon and Nerides shouldn't have been able to reproduce and they did. Anyways, let's not defend incest. So what is speculated of Isis and Nephthys is very similar to like the Virginia Woolf and Vita uh, West type relationship because I had to mention Virginia Woolf somewhere. You know, they were both married women with families or whatever and they just had a secret special relationship. They were just gal pals, you know? They were just gal palling around in secret. I said they were both married, but it is also considered that the marriage between Nephthys and Set, who was another big fella in the Pantheon, I don't think they had Pantheon. He was a big guy. He was, he was, you know, pretty famous. But their marriage was considered to be a marriage of convenience. So if you don't know anything about Virginia Woolf and her husband, their marriage was considered to be a marriage of convenience too. A lot of queer people, like queer men and queer women, got married to one another as like a protection, as safety. What gives this like theory legs is that Isis was said to have acted as a surrogate for Nephthys and gave birth to her son Anubis. So like Nephthys and Set never 
did the deed. The other thing we know is that Isis and Nethys spend a lot of time together, obviously, gal pals. And so the fact that Nethys' son was Anubis and Isis' son was Horus, they are both like Anubis presided in the underworld and Horus presided in the above world, they were considered to represent death and rebirth. And just among with this, like Nephthys was associated with the goddess Anuket, who above all other things, was the goddess of lust. I think even if we can't say Isis was gay, I think Nephthys was 100% gay. Another thing from each Egyptian mythology, uh, a minor god named Wajet was rumored to have a secret relationship with Mart. Mart was when you die. Actually, I've got a video about this. If you want to watch it, you really don't have to. But, you know, Wajet was rumored to have a relationship with Mart. I don't know if I believe this because Mart was the judge of the afterlife. And I feel like she, it would go against her personal ethics because <laughs> adultery is one of the questions that she asks uh, for judgment when you're are passing through the afterlife. It just doesn't make sense to me personally. But Wajet's myth is a little more interesting because it's also rumored that she was married to Hapi and Hapi was um, a god of the Nile. But more importantly, Hapi was, I feel like Hapi was trans because he is often described as having breasts, but being a man. You know, they didn't have top surgery back then. If a trans man existed, he'd probably have breasts, but he is in all regards referenced as a he, as a man, as a god, not a goddess. Another thing is that he is sometimes described as having a distended belly. I don't know. One of the things I read said that that could be his like uterus bulge. <laughs> hey, why not? Uh, but he also had a beard, but it was false. It was not a real beard. It was a ceremonial beard, but only male gods wore ceremonial beard. Something to think about there. Uh, I guess the importance of this one is the symbolism in the myth itself. As he is a fertility god, a lot of fertility gods had phallic symbolism. A good example of this is the god Min, who's literally depicted as having an erection. Whereas Happy is never depicted as having any phallic traits. Happy. It's probably trans and was in a relationship with Wajet, who was definitely bisexual. So I have a list of honorable mentions that I'm going to uh, fire off rapid fire speed round. Honorable mentions. Freya, the Norse god of fertility, who doesn't exactly have any direct myth associated with him being gay, but he was worshipped by a homosexual cult. Loki, you definitely know who Loki is, the Norse trickster god bisexual and gender fluid, uh, experimented with gender presentation quite a lot. Chen, who was a Mayan goddess of maize magic and also homosexuality and same-sex marriage. While she was seen as a woman, it's unclear whether she was maybe trans or she was a lesbian because like I said, Spanish colonization, the language around her myth is very male-centric. Then we go to Satis, who was an Egyptian river goddess who came to be associated with masturbation, but she is also known to protect the same-sex love between women specifically, which is kind of rare. Sedna, who is an Inuit goddess of the sea and marine life. She was two-spirit and bisexual with a preference of women. So a bi-lesbian, love that. And as I said, like myth often, it's, you know, designed to teach a lesson in a lot of cases. Um, this one is maybe one of the bad ones, but we have Zhao Wang, who was a Chinese king who became a demigod. He wasn't a good ruler. He raised taxes, which made everyone broke. And, and he used that tax money to fund orgies and big sex parties. Um, so he was overthrown and he endgamed, um, unalived himself after being overthrown. And when he got to heaven and the heavenly judges you know, were trying to figure out what to do with him, he begged and he begged to be made a god. And they kind of played a trick on him to teach him a lesson, which I, hmm, I don't know how I feel about this, but I'm gonna tell you how it ends. They were like, oh, actually a funny thing. So glad you're here. We just like invented a new god title and, and you are perfect for it. And here you go, you are, the god of sodomy. So yeah, maybe he liked that. He did throw sex parties. I couldn't leave out an instance of queer relationships within Christianity. So we've got Saint Sergius and Bacchus. So this was from the Christian Bible. This story is basically considered to be a parallel of the Achilles and Patroclus type myth. 
uh, if you're not aware, it's like heavily debated that Achilles and Patroclus were lovers. Hypermasculine society will not accept that two warriors could also be gay, but they definitely are gay. So yeah, Saint Sergius and Bacchus were just, you know, also two guys just being bros. So I have a little a little section about Celtic myth in here because it's it kind of sucks what happened to scotland and ireland celtic myth was one of the mythologies that underwent one of the most severe censorship and destruction of any evidence of our myth and language and cultural sites etc due to catholic colonization not much has really survived apart from you know surface level myth that's widespread but regional myth is less known but what there is remaining is a story again very similar to the Achilles and Patroclus thing between two warriors named Cucalain and Pheridiae. Yep, they were warriors, except plot twist, they were on opposing sides. So it was like Romeo and Juliet type deal. I have to mention this here, even though it's not technically a mythology, it is a part of the history. So I have to mention the Greek poet Sappho. You may be familiar with the term Sappho or know of the Greek poet who hailed from the island of Lesbos. She wrote poetry and a lot of her poetry was destroyed. But what survived was a famous poem called The Odes Aphrodite, where the character of the poem is praying to Aphrodite to give them strength and help them gain the love of an unnamed woman. They ask Aphrodite to to ease their pain of this unrequited love and then it's revealed in the final section of the poem that the speaker of the poem is Sappho herself. In the time it was interpreted it was a topic for debate because it was discovered in the early you know the time of western civilization fucking everything up. It was heavily debated whether the poem was actually about a woman loving another woman until the 1960s which is really recent in history when you think about how long ago, you know, Greece was like the major ancient society of that time. I just wanted to mention this in here as a prime example of how historians struggle to accept the existence of queer and gay women specifically in myth and history. And because of the discovery of Sappho's poetry, we now have the term sapphic, which means a woman who is attracted to other women that can be bisexual or lesbian. And we have the word lesbian derived from the island that she lived so that's a win for the team team gay one point a last one here which i don't know why i left this to the very end but we have one more wahini amo which was a hawaiian goddess uh, depicted as having multiple relationships with other goddesses her most famous relationship was with a goddess named Hayaka, who was the goddess of hula dancing sorcery and medicine and also goddess Hopoe, who I don't really know much about. A lot of Polynesian culture was also heavily censored and destroyed. So like finding like Pacifica mythology is really difficult. So I was really excited when I found this Hawaiian myth because it's just kind of difficult to find. Hayaka was also known to have other relationships with other goddesses, specifically Palopole, who was the goddess of ferns. And I think that is why gays love plants so much, because all of the gods who like looked over flowers and plants and stuff all ended up being gay or queer. So that's kind of neat. That covers basically the sexuality side of it. I do have a lot more myths to tell in the next video. I just, I really wanted to drill home that like sexuality was a thing. Being queer, being under the LGBTQ plus umbrella, it's not a new thing. Like it has been written about all over the world, everywhere, different regions, regions who would have never connected with other regions. Like it's everywhere and it's old as fuck. <laughs> So that's the end of this video about sexuality. The next video will be about gender. Thank you if you watched all of this. Sorry, it's a bit more information heavy than the other stuff I've been doing. Tell me your favorite mythology. I don't know. But other than that, thank you for watching. And I hope you come back again in the future. Very much appreciate it. Like, comment, subscribe, and I'll see you in the next one.